Hello my dear jewelry lovers. Today I will tell you a story about rash actions connected with the desire to get rich quickly, and we will start the story with the tiara of the Portland family. Unlike the sapphire tiara, which was just a beautiful piece of jewelry for a beautiful woman, this jewel was made for ceremonial purposes. In 1902, Alexandra of Denmark was crowned with her husband, Edward VII. And so the Duchess of Portland was one of the ladies who held a gold brocade canopy over the Queen during the anointing ceremony. So especially for this event, the Duchess commissioned a magnificent diamond tiara. Winifred, Duchess of Portland, was slender, very beautiful by the standards of her era, and, most importantly, statuesque, so this diamond splendor suited her very well. After the coronation, several stones were taken out of the tiara and a brooch was made in addition to it. The brooch could be disassembled and the stones returned to the tops of the tiara's prongs, making them higher. When in the 1920s it became fashionable to wear headbands and tiaras, shifting them high on the forehead, jewelry was made with this in mind. But nobody prevented the old tiaras from being worn in a similar way. And, judging by this portrait, the Duchess did. Although the original idea was different, to paint the Duchess in the outfit she wore at the coronation. But that's even better. And I can't help but tell the story told by the Duke of Portland himself in his memoirs. It was already the 1930s. One day, when his wife was dressing for dinner, he went into her room and threw himself into a chair. At that moment both the Duchess, the maid, and the Duke himself screamed. The ladies in terror, and he felt the teeth of the tiara digging into his soft spot. Naturally, the tiara broke into pieces, while that very spot of my poor person resembled the mines of Golconda. So many precious stones were there. Oh, that's all right. It's fixed. And the next Duchess of Portland, Ivy, also wore the diamond beauty with dignity. Here she is in it, wearing it as a ceremonial costume for Elizabeth II's coronation. This is how the tiara continued its journey, from 20 to XXI. In 1977, Ivy founded a foundation that still exists today, tending to the family's magnificent art collection, organizing educational events, exhibitions, and more. In 2016, they opened an art gallery at Welbeck Abbey, the Duke's country estate. And the famous tiara paired with a brooch, in a special glass display case, of course, were displayed alongside other exhibits. So, in November 2018, thieves broke in. The display case did not resist. The guards reacted quickly, in a minute and a half, but it was too late, the tiara and brooch were stolen. Yes, several people were later detained, and recently, in 2022, there was a trial, they were found guilty. Except that neither the tiara nor the brooch were recovered. According to one version, they were then immediately transported to Turkey. Whatever the case, they are unlikely to resurface in the coming years. Or maybe never. But as it turned out in modern history, there were still tiaras that were stolen. In 2012, a sensational news hit Sweden, the family diamond tiara and other gold jewelry worth a million kroner, about $115,000, was stolen from the house of Princess Christina of Sweden, one of the younger sisters of the reigning King Carl XVI Gustav. The antique family tiara, given to the princess by her parents on the day of her majority, was decorated with small old-cut diamonds and oriental pearls, and its historical value was much higher than its material value. Of course, such a valuable thing did not lie in plain sight, it was kept in a safe hidden behind the bookshelves in the library. The princess wore the tiara on special occasions, such as royal weddings and other events, as well as the Nobel Prize reception. On the 21st of May, 2012, she was going to wear it for the christening of little Estelle, the daughter of her niece, Crown Princess Victoria. But the safe turned out to be empty. The shocked princess called her husband, Thord Magnusson, and the couple called the police and began to remember who had recently entered the library besides them. There were two, a cleaning lady and a 19-year-old refugee. And if everything is clear with the cleaning lady, the appearance of a refugee in the flat of the king's sister requires some clarification. A native of Somalia fled his native country at a very young age, alone, without parents, brothers and sisters. 
he first lived in Holland, where he became involved with criminal elements and received a suspended sentence for theft and drugs. When the Dutch land began to burn under his feet, he moved to Sweden in 2009, where he was not yet known. The refugee was given a small flat in the Stockholm suburb of Tenster and a gym membership at a local school. Coincidentally, Princess Magnusson's husband supervised the school as a member of the royal family, participating in its social initiatives and liaising with the staff. And when he was told of the tragic fate of a 19-year-old boy who found himself alone in a foreign country, the 71-year-old Magnusson, himself a father of three sons, took it to heart. He couldn't replace the Somali's mum and dad, but he arranged with the social services in the suburb of Tenster to become the refugee social mentor. Magnusson genuinely wanted to give him what he felt he needed, a sense of security, a job and a friendly warmth. The refugee got a job at the Opera Café and was invited to stay at the home of the princess and her husband on several occasions. For a year and a half Magnusson and the princess took care of the young man, and then came the 18th of May, 2012. On that day, the couple threw a party for friends, to which they invited the Somali man. When the fun was over, all the guests expressed a desire to walk to the royal castle, all except the refugee. He said he would stay in the house to clear the table. Magnusson later wondered why this wish did not seem strange to him, but at the time, perhaps under the influence of alcoholic vapors, it seemed quite natural to him. The couple left to see the guests off, and the refugee was left alone in the house. Later, when questioned, he confessed that the idea of stealing from his hosts had occurred to him when he found the keys to the safe in the library. Did he realize that suspicion would fall on him first? Anyway, Magnusson, having discovered the theft, sent his protégé a text message saying, I want to talk to you because jewelry has disappeared from the safe. On the 23rd of May, five days after the theft of the tiara, Magnusson and the refugee decided to meet at Stockholm Central Station. The meeting turned out to be truly heartbreaking. In front of the crowd, the Somali man fell at the feet of the princess's husband and began to sob hysterically, so Magnusson had to take the young man to a park. There, a dialogue took place between them that went something like this. Oh, forgive me, I won't do it again, it happened, I took the jewelry, I'm very ashamed. I'm sorry you're confused, but you have to go to the police. Oh, don't, 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 I won't do it again, I've taken the jewelry, I'm ashamed. Understand that I want to help you. I understand, but don't go to the police, I'm very ashamed. Seeing that the Somali was not ready for active repentance, Magnusson postponed the conversation. At half past eleven in the evening that same day, the Somali started his song, but then, unexpectedly for both him and Magnusson, Princess Christina appeared who was visiting friends who lived near the metro station. At the sight of her, the Somali sat down on the ground and wept, and then told the whole truth, after the theft, he was so tormented by remorse that he threw the tiara, which he kept in a black cloth bag, into the water. And there, at the bottom of the sea, it rests. The most interesting thing in this story is not the abundance of tears, but the fact that the stolen tiara has not been found to this day. According to the Swedish police, if it is not lying at the bottom of the sea, it was most likely dismantled and the diamonds and pearls were sold separately, because the piece is too recognizable and it is impossible to sell it as a whole. And do you think it could have been found by a random passerby? Write comments.